Okay, there. Morning. Morning. Welcome to the PCP webinar for today. I'm Sheree Cervantes from the Philippine Society of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. And it is just so timely that we were given this day to uh, host this webinar of the PCP because the, the, we just recently celebrated the National Allergy Day last July 7. And actually the celebration, the nationwide celebration was done yesterday via Facebook Live also. So for this morning, our topic would be immunity and the cytokine storm in COVID-19. So let's start with a prayer. Let us remember that we are in the holy presence of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for bringing us together again virtually this week. We lift up to you our speakers. May you enlighten their minds as they share their knowledge and expertise with us. We ask you to open our ears and our minds for us to be able to retain what we need to know to help our suffering brethren. We continue to ask for your grace of healing for our patients. We lift up to you our colleagues in healthcare. May we all be instruments of your love for your children. And in doing so, please cover each and every one of us with your most precious blood. And we pray for the souls of all who succumb to this pandemic. May you welcome them into your heavenly kingdom to enjoy eternal happiness with you. All these we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. So once again, welcome to the webinar, this PCP webinar hosted by the Philippine Society of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. The objectives that were given to us by PCP are to be briefly review the immune reaction in viral infections, to highlight the immune system response in SARS-CoV-2, to discuss the basis and value of serologic tests in the diagnosis of COVID-19, to present and explain the concept of cytokine storm in COVID-19, to enumerate the risk factors in developing cytokine storm, and to provide guidance on the use of steroids and other immuno immunomodulatory agents in COVID-19. So uh, just some house rules. This webinar is being recorded. For your questions and comments, please type them in the chat box. You may address specific concerns as a private message in the chat box. During the open forum, uh, I will be the one to field the questions to the speakers. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a very distinguished speaker for this morning. She graduated from the UT College of Medicine in 1996 and took up her residency training program, uh, residency training in internal medicine and fellowship in allergy and immunology at the UPPGH. She is an assistant professor at the UP College of Medicine, and she was our former head at the section of allergy and immunology at the Department of Medicine for, uh, of the UPPGH for 15 years. Currently, she practices at St. Luke's at both at Quezon City and at the Global City. And during the open forum, she will be joined by one of our, one of our alumni from the UPTGH, Dr. Ian Fruto, Fruto Teoderico uh, is a graduate of the, doc, of the Cebu Institute of College of Medicine. He took up his postgraduate internship in Perpetual Sucre Hospital, where he also took up his residency in internal medicine. And then he joined us at the UPPGH for his fellowship training in allergy immunology. He is a very active uh, consultant practicing in Cebu right now, 
He, he has so many COVID patients with, at, in his three hospitals, Perpetual Socor, Cebu Veles, General Hospital, and the Visayas Community Medical Center. So without further ado, may I present to you Dr. Lara Teresa Alentahan Aleta. So good morning, everybody. Kindly give me a minute to set up my presentation. Okay. So first and foremost, I would like to thank the PCP under the presidency of Dr. Mario Panaligan, my dear friend, Dr. Aldrin Loyola, chairman of the Committee on Con Continuing Medical Education and Dr. Agnes T. Cruz, champion regent, Committee on Continuing Medical Education for inviting me. I'd also like to thank my dear colleague, Dr. Sherry Cervantes for volunteering me for this morning's talk. As COVID-19 is now a worldwide spread zoonosis, it might be practically impossible to fulfill or to fully eradicate the SARS-CoV virus. There is a pressing need for an improved understanding of its immunopathology, much more than any previous pathogen, as COVID-19 has become number one reason for morbidity and mortality in many countries. Even though this pandemic will likely be brought under control in the coming months, unexpected outbreaks and the development of viral resistance to treatments or vaccines are highly possible due to mutations of the virus. Hence, our immunity is important to face the challenges of this still evolving infection. What is immunity? Simply put, it is our body's defense against infection. So I would like to thank the PCP for giving me the specific objectives to tackle for today's webinar. To start, let us review the natural immune response to viral infections. Our innate immunity is inborn. It plays a critical role early in our life and it continues to provide immediate protection throughout our life as human beings. The real frontliners of the innate immune system are your macrophages, natural killer cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and your specialized antigen presenting cells, which are your dendritic cells. The innate immune responses are initiated by recognition of molecular components of microorganisms that are foreign to us. These are we, what we call pathogen associated molecular patterns. So in other words, our innate immunity is our first line of defense. It is selective, but not antigen specific. It is the gatekeeper of the adaptive immunity, meaning they give signals, the, immune, the innate immunity gives signals via the T cell and the natural killer T cell for the adaptive immune response to commence. Our adaptive immunity is antigen specific and with long-term memory, which is measured by your antibodies. But I would like to introduce a special kind of antibody, which is not part of the adaptive immune system. And this is what we call your anti-glycan IgM antibody, also known as our natural IgM. Again, this is part of our innate immune response. As part of the innate immune response, these natural IgMs can directly neutralize a viral particle. It can activate the complement pathway. It can trigger the antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity by your NK cells. And it can opsonize viruses for phagocytosis, all in the effort of eliminating the virus. Again, this is our first line of defense, our immediate protection. 
This is in contrast to the antibodies produced by the adaptive immune response, which develop after the virus has been eliminated and which confer long-term protection. What are IgM against the, anti against the glycans? What are anti-glycan antibodies? They are antibodies that recognize polysaccharides or glycoproteins, also known as glycolipids or proteoglycans, which are found on a lot of surfaces of cells. In our body, the most popular cell would be our erythrocytes, and these anti-glycan antibodies are responsible for our ABO blood typing. They're also found on the surfaces of immune cells and envelopes of microorganisms. They are important for tumor surveillance, autoimmunity prevention, defense against pathogens, and response to vaccines. Anti-glycan antibodies are produced after birth with or without exposure to, uh, to infection. Why is this so? Because we have glucans on our own cells. As I said, it was, it's most popularly seen in our red blood cells. Um, the levels of the anti-glycan antibodies are highest um, during childhood, and this is probably because this is the peak of production of antibodies due to the different antigen exposure of the child. And the levels decrease with age, especially after the age of 40. Surprisingly, but not significantly, it has also been seen that these anti-glycan antibodies are a bit lower in the male's than in females as to why we really do not know. So in terms of immunity, these natural antibodies can be considered broad spectrum because the antigen it recognizes is ubiquitous. A lot of our viruses have glycoproteins on their surface. And on this slide, uh, I show you the herpes virus with their glycoproteins. The Ebola virus also has a glycoprotein the HIV virus with their GP um, glycoprotein spikes, your influenza virus with their hemagglutinin, and your coronavirus with their spike proteins. So even without the adaptive immune response, our bodies can clear these viruses because of the presence of our natural antibodies or your anti-glycan IgM. So let us now focus on the innate immune response to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. We all know now that SARS-CoV-2 is very similar to SARS-CoV and the most important antigen on the virus is the spike glycoprotein. Thanks to the spike glycoproteins that link to the host receptors, particularly the ACE2 receptors, these coronaviruses are able to enter the host cell. Once it enters the host cell, it can now replicate and be released to invade other cells which have the ACE2 receptors. We also know now that ACE2 receptors are abundantly found in the lungs, in your intestines, in your cardiovascular system, your kidneys, skin, testes, brain, and even the tongue. Once the virus enters the cell, it can now replicate and induce inflammation. Cytokines are released by your innate immune cells to eliminate the virus, which happens in 90% of the patients who have been infected. And once in convalescence, the adaptive immune response now produces IgGs and IgMs for hopefully long-term immunity. However, in 10% of people who get infected, or are at risk, the hyperinflammation occurs, which can lead to cytokine storm. And we will get to that later. For now, let me share with you this very interesting article about the first holistic immunological model of COVID-19 published in 1820 by Matricardi, Del Negro, and Nisini in the journal Pediatric Allergy and Immunology. The natural history of COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2 is extremely variable, ranging from asymptomatic infection to pneumonia and to complications that can be fatal. Based on this article, 
the outcome of the first crucial 10 to 15 days after infection hangs on the balance between the cumulative dose of viral exposure and the efficacy of the local innate immune response. Again, these are your natural IgA and IgM antibodies. This is a diagram of the different COVID-19 clinical courses and trajectories of adaptive immune response and viral shedding. The cumulative amount of virus exposure acquired by a patient at the start of infection cannot be measured, but definitely healthcare workers handling COVID patients would have a higher exposure than the regular person. The consequences of infect Infection with SARS-CoV-2 vary from benign to life-threatening, again. While many infected individuals remain asymptomatic or experience only mild upper airway symptoms, others develop symptomatic pneumonia, which may progress to ARDS, requiring intubation, some may develop multi-organ failure, and some may expire. Viral shedding begins two to three days before symptoms. And thanks to one's innate immunity, the viral load lessens such that infectivity seems to decline significantly after 10 days from symptom onset. But the virus can be detected for a median of 20 days and up to 37 days among survivors. So this slide shows us the importance of the SARS-CoV-2 to neutralizing antibody ratio. So the balance of natural immunity, which are your natural IgMs, natural IgAs, and the dose of the viral exposure is relevant to decide if SARS-CoV-2 will penetrate the lower airways. So the main role of our innate immune response is to protect the lower airways. Among children and young adults, normally innate immunity predominates, so the virus is cleared. In the upper airways, we have natural antibodies and other components of the innate immune system that protect the lower airways, and it is found in your saliva and secretions. We can cough them out. That is part of our defense mechanism, and we can block the virus as early as this. So especially if the dose of exposure is low, then again, we can overcome the viral infection. So the top three um, requirements for a good immune response to the virus would have be low viral load. We should have a very good upper airway defense system and our innate immune system should be intact and functioning properly. This next slide shows that if there is massive viral load, especially for healthcare workers with repeated exposure, it can overcome a normal immune system and it, it, it can now penetrate the lower airways. For patients who, are, who have comorbidities or are relatively immunocompromised, a low to medium viral load can overcome the immune system and can penetrate to the lower airways. Complications may arise if the virus reaches the alveoli and massive replication has occurred because in the lung, especially in the alveoli, there is no local resistance. High affinity antibodies are produced by the adaptive immune response and surprisingly may not be good for us because it can trigger the complement activation, it can cause coagulation and cytokine storm. Natural antibodies can neutralize viral infectivity in a number of ways. As summarized in this illustration, they may interfere with the virus binding to the receptors, they can block the uptake into the cells, and they can prevent uncoating of the genomes in endosomes or cause antibody antigen complexes for renal clearance. But non-neutralizing antibodies may enhance the immune system causing hyperinflammation or cytokine storm. 
Now that we are discussing antibodies, we now go to the basis and value of serologic tests in the diagnosis of COVID-19. And this is based on an article by Ward et al. in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology published just last month. The SARS-CoV-2 particle is composed of multiple virally encoded proteins. And these proteins are antigens for antibody production. The S protein is the largest and most antigenic and can be cleaved to split into the S1 subunit and the S2 subunit. The N protein binds the viral genome, which is protected by your E protein found in the viral envelope membrane and membrane protein, which is the most abundant structural protein. All of these have their own specific antibodies. The most specific antibody for SARS-CoV-2 is the S1 antibody. The S2 antibody and the N antibodies are found in both SARS and COVID. Hence, it is not specific for COVID-19. Your envelope protein antibodies and your antibodies to the M protein have, can be detected, but their clinical significance is unknown. So based on this article, this diagram of COVID-19 testing, its uses and modalities are by clinical phase. For diagnosis, treatment, and infection control and epidemiologic monitoring, these are reliant on the proper use of nucleic acid testing via RT-PCR and anti-SARS-CoV-2 serology which checks your anti IG, which checks your IgM and IgG, and each test has a maximal utility at a given clinical phase. Nucleic acid test via the RT PCR is most useful during the late incubation and symptomatic illness, and serology being useful during re resolution of illness or convalescence. Classically. IgM antibodies develop early in an acute infection before the IgGs, but recent reports suggest that the IgM and the IgG seroconversion occurs simultaneously in many subjects during the second week of infection. The persistence of protective humoral Ig-mediated immunity is not yet established for COVID-19 survivors, and the natural history of asymptomatic carriers for SARS-CoV-2 is also not yet clear. So this article summarizes that serologic tests are not recommended to be used for the diagnosis because the timing of the appearance of the IgM and IgG is variable and may be delayed. They are also related to the severity of infection, meaning it's not always good to have high IgG levels because it has been shown that with higher IgG levels, it, you, it can actually detect a more severe infection. Serologic tests can be used in epidemiologic studies and surveillance, as well as identifying patients who can become convalescent serum donors for experimental treatment protocols. Now that we have discussed what happens in the 90% of the infected people who recover, let us now focus on the 10% that go into hyperinflammation, or what we popularly know now as cytokine storm. So again, the definition of cytokine storm is the exaggerated increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines in COVID-19 due to the hyperactivation of various kinds of immune cells in response to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The SARS-CoV-2 virus stimulates the immune system in several ways. It can attach and enter the cell causing production of cytokines. It can attract neutralizing antibodies and it can attach to an antigen presenting cell. And in this diagram, it is the macrophage. The secretion of large quantities of chemokines and cytokines is promoted in infected cells in response to the infection. 
And these cytokines and, cyto and chemokines in turn, in turn recruit lymphocytes and leukocytes to the site of infection, all for the purpose of viral clearance. Whether the viral load is increasing or if the immune system goes into hyperdrive despite the clearance of the virus, there will be multi-organ damage and possibly death. This clinical worsening is exponential, which I liken to a runaway snowball. Here is where clinically immunomodulators are indicated. However, any intervention at this point, in my humble opinion, may or may not be effective, and this is due to the snowball effect. There is a recent study published in the Nature Reviews Immunology just last month involving macrophage hyperactivity in COVID-19. This macrophage secretes cytokines to communicate with other cells. Here, the macrophage is communicating with the NK cells, the CD4 and the CD8 cells using the cytokines. And these cytokines control cell proliferation, differentiation, angiogenesis, and immunologic and inflammatory response. There are different types of cytokines with overlapping networks and redundancy of roles. In cytokine storm, initially there is an elevated amount of interleukin-1 beta and tumor necrosis factor. This acute response triggers the proliferation of interleukin-6, which promotes a more sustained pro-inflammatory state, which correlates well with worsening disease. Normally, we develop interleukin-10, which appears later causing a negative feedback to interleukin-6, and it is the body's attempt to control inflammation. But in cytokine storm, this may not happen. Interferon gamma, although protective in the context of antiviral host defense, has also been implicated in the pathogenesis of cytokine storm. As they say, too much of a good thing may be bad. And at this point, once all of these mediators are released, we may not be able to control the overall production of these cytokines. And remember the snowball effect. So what puts a person at risk for cytokine storm? A lot of research was done to predict who would go into cytokine storm. And I have, I have grouped these risk factors into the common and rare factors. So for the common risk factors, obviously, if you have a high viral load, then you will elicit a stronger immune response. A high viral load can overcome a normal immune system or a low to medium viral load with a weak innate immune system may also trigger a, a, more, a stronger immune response. So if you have low IgM and IgA in the upper airways, once the virus gets into the lungs, then a lot of inflammation will occur. For low CD4 and CD8, um, which means that you have a defective adaptive immunity, you will have a lot of interleukin-6 mediators, but low interleukin-1. And so common risk factors are usually age, advancing age, comorbidities like your diabetes and hypertension and vitamin D deficiency, which has been associated with a dysfunctional immune system. For about, for children, for example, and for those who are not really exposed to a very high viral load, they have an intact immune system, but they have macrophage hyperactivity. They may have a very high IgG with very high interleukin-6 and high interleukin-1 levels. Unfortunately, we cannot predict who will have this uh, profile because it is genetically predis, uh, predestined and it has something to do with a defective interferon response. We need epigenetic studies for this. If we can predict who will go into cytokine storm, then our management for these patients would be more proactive rather than reactive. So when we are dealing with cytokine storm, our therapeutic ap approach is that of immunomodulation. 
and the end point of immunomodulation is homeostasis. And immunomodulation is a delicate and complicated balance between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory immune response. So this diagram just shows it's not a CISO kind of balance, but it is very uh, intricate. So we now go to the topic of immunomodulators. So what is the definition of immunomodulators? These are agents that act on the immune system to change its pace. So it can slow down the immune system, it can speed up the immune system, or it can um, confer intolerance. Oh, I'm sorry, it can confer tolerance. So cytokines are, are our natural immunomodulators in the form of interferons, tumor necrosis factors, and interleukins. And we also have our chemically synthesized drugs for immunomodulation. And for that, I would like to share our society's review paper on immunomodulators for COVID-19 published last April, 2020. This paper compiled all available journals on almost all drugs used for COVID-19 with the consideration of mechanisms of action of the immunomodulator, efficacy of treatment for cytokine storm, dose and timing of administration and safety profile for each immunomodulator. So this is just a slide of a table of the most common drugs used for COVID-19 and the available publications for each. So this is available. Um, I think it, the full text is uh, freely available online if you just visit the website of the Philippine Society of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology. And so the next slides will just help us visualize how these drugs act on the immunopathology of COVID-19 infection. For the virus-specific immunomodulators, these are your neutralizing antibodies in the form of convalescent plasma, hyperimmune globulin, and your IVIG. So it acts the same as your natural neutralizing antibodies. For hydroxychloroquine, it has been shown that it can inhibit the viral entry into the cell and it can block the coronavirus endosomal fusion that releases the virus into the host cell. And of course, one cytokine has in, ensued, we have our monoclonal antibodies against them that can block their interleukin-1, your interlu TNF alpha, your interleukin-6, and your interferon gammas. So for the early stage of infection, these immunomodulators may be effective. So your corticosteroids mechanism of action is the inhibition of the transcription of many cytokine genes, including genes for interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha. It is most beneficial if given early in the disease. Steroids can also eliminate activated immune cells and infected antigen presenting cells, cytotoxic lymphocytes, and histiocytes. In the succeeding stage, the inhibition of TNF alpha may be an important step to reduce the infection. Anti TNF alpha has been considered as a possible early treatment modality to reduce SARS CoV infection, as currently being studied in, in a randomized controlled trial in China. Of course, in the most symptomatic phase of the disease, where your cytokines are at, it, at their peak, the following monoclonal antibodies can be given to antagonize these cytokines. So in choosing which immunomodulator to use for your patient, know if and when your treatment will be effective, know the risk and benefits of each drug, and may we find that golden period when a treatment can be given at the earliest time to give our patients the best outcome for recovery. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Aleta, for that uh, very comprehensive and uh, very informative lecture. Um, during our open forum, 
We have with us Dr. Ian Fruto Teodorico, who would also join Dr. Aleta to answer some of the questions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Teodorico is an immunologist based in Cebu, and he has a lot of experience with the COVID patients there. Okay, some of the answer, uh, some of the questions and the Q and A have already been answered by uh, a member of our team, Dr. Akawili. And uh, I will throw the questions, field the questions that haven't been answered yet. Okay. Uh, does the COVID-19 virus RNA have to enter the nucleus or have to penetrate the nucleus to affect transcription and translation into viral components? I think the, the mechanism is because the viron can fuse with the host's genetic material and that's why it can escape um, detection once it goes out of the cell. So the virus definitely replicates using the host's mechanism. So I, I guess because of the fusion using the endosomes, then there's a com combination of the RNA with our host RNA. And that's why they say um, that's where mutations occur because of this um, fusion of host RNA and viral RNA. Okay. Another question about the, the entry and the transfer of the COVID-19 virus. Can COVID-19 virus, can the, can the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus transfer directly from cell to cell via tight junctions or other cellular transmembrane passages? When you say tight junctions, it's between cells. So when the, the virus is not inside the cell, then it can easily be eliminated by physical factors like your phlegm, your secretions. But when a virus becomes virulent, when it can enter the host cell, so the tight junctions are outside the host cell. Um, tight junctions are really for probably your, your uh, fluids. Um, so for the virus to be virulent, it has to enter the cell and it is through the ACE2 receptors. Thank you. How is hypertension, which is a common risk factor, implicated uh, against the immunity to COVID-19 clearance? Um, there's no, uh, there are a lot of uh, speculation about hypertension associating, uh, associated with more severe COVID disease. And most likely it's one could be really age of a patient. And with increasing age, you have, you are more at risk of developing hypertension. Your immune system weakens because it's getting older. And um, it, it definitely has something to do with your ACE2 receptors. So the more ACE2 receptors you have, then um, the mechanism of hypertension, of, we all know that there are many mechanisms in developing hypertension, a lot of risk factors for that. But in terms of COVID-19, I guess it's more the number of your ACE2 receptors um, that predisposes a patient with hypertension to a more severe disease. Uh the next question I would like to field to Dr. Dr. Teodorico. Um, the question is COVID survivors may not be recommended to donate plasma if they recovered after five weeks. Uh, how's, how is it done in Cebu, Dr. Teodorico? Uh, okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, Dr. Aleta, thank you for a very extensive lecture for this very difficult to manage clinical entity. Uh, here in Cebu, I think everybody has have, uh, must have heard by now that we are in the limelight, not for the best of reasons, because of the uh, increasing number of cases. So me, I've been on board for about, since April for 16 or 17 cases. Uh, majority of the cases that have been referred to me are already in the critical stage. Uh, most of the patients that I see, uh, I use the CDK Mera stage of classification. So that's stage one, two, and three. For stage one, 
majority of the patients belong only to stage one. They manifest with what the publicly what, what the public term as the influenza-like illness. No, for those patients who are much younger, no comorbidities, even without the intervention of immunomodulators, many of them recover. However, for the smaller proportion who reach stage two, as already inflammatory state, they, they manifest as difficulty of breathing. There's already evidence for uh, parenchymal infection of the lungs, pneumonia. Uh, that is when there are already an interplay of cytokines. Uh, apart from the infection itself, it becomes mainly inflammatory. Now, a smaller proportion reaches the hyperinflammatory state. Uh, for my experience, I mentioned 16 or 17 cases. Those that have received IVIG are not that many because of the because of the price of the IVIG. No, I've only had honestly four cases who completed the course who were discharged. Now uh, there were two who completed the course; they improved. However. Four or five days later, one of them died because of intra-abdominal bleeding. Another one acquired a different infection. Hospital acquired pneumonia and deteriorated despite improving after the IVIG. Uh, as for the rest, uh, many of them were not able to comply the full dose. No, They only got the first day or some of them did not even get the IVIG is given according to weight. Some of them cannot comply because per vial here in Cebu, uh, in the pharmacies, it's 23,600. But if you buy it directly from the supplier, it's around 14,000, 15,000. So the average patient who weighs above 60 kilos will reach, will receive at least six to eight vials per day for, a, for four to five days. Now, uh, I just would like to add before I answer the question, Dr. Shiria, uh, yeah. regarding the risk factors, uh, 75 to 80% of all the patients referred to me were diabetic, no? We all know that diabetes itself is already a risk factor for acquiring infection. No, but why is this adding more morbidity to COVID-19 patients, no? As mentioned by Dr. earlier, Aleta, there's dysregulation of the innate immune system in diabetes, especially if it's uncontrolled. The high glucose levels will lead to the shunting through the Poly all pathway, and then it will activate the protein kinase C, whereby you will have formation of superoxides. This is the one that leads to the formation of what we call ADE products, advanced glycation end products. These AGE products are the reasons why we have an increase in the pro inflammatory cytokines such as your TNF alpha, interleukin 1, beta, interleukin 6. As you notice, these three are the ones also elevated in SARS CoV 2. So I think that's uh, me, that's a uh, uh, very you know logical deduction as to why diabetic patients have it a lot worse. They really have a more morbid course, and they many of them, especially those who are 60 and above and uncontrolled, they really reach the cytokine storm stage. Uh, with regards to the question, oh, you're you're. Somebody asked, what was that, Doc? Uh, in, uh, when is the timing for? For convalescent plasma. Uh, the best cell specialist to answer would be the hematologist. But from what I know, because we've been hand-in-hand uh, -hand working together, uh, they require at least 14 days asymptomatic after the last day of, of being symptomatic. You have to be diagnosed PCR positive. 14 days asymptomatic after the last day of symptomatic, and then they have to check your IgG levels. Uh, there's a study showing that the IgG, the IgG levels after a post-infection declines after two to three months. So there's a specific time frame where you have to have your IgG levels checked because beyond that period, uh, they may start to decline and they will not be valid candidates for convalescent plasma. Yeah. To add to that, I think there is a cutoff of titers it has to be one is to 640 that means yes, if, yes. If, if, if you have that many if you have that much um antibodies then you are a very good candidate for don donating your blood for convalescent plasma thank you 
in relation to that, there was a question on um, about patients taking ACE2 inhibitors as maintenance and their susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Can you comment on this? Um, ACE2 receptor blockers like your low sartan bind to the same receptor as your SARS-CoV-2. That's why they're saying that if you take your ACE2 receptor blockers as an antihypertensive, you lessen the receptors available for the SARS to bind to. But uh, there are not much clinical evidence to confirm that. But well, it's a logical assumption because knowing that they bind to the same receptor, of course, there are other factors involving that. And there are different ways also for your virus to, um, to, to infect a host. So um, they just they're just recommending that if you are taking an ACE2 receptor, don't, don't discontinue, just continue it. But again, clinical trials are showing no difference whether you're on ACE2 block or not. Are there certain individuals uh, with, uh, or certain characteristics of individuals with high levels of ACE2 in a uh, of ACE2 receptor, or is it generally the same for everyone? I'm sorry, kindly, kindly repeat your question. Uh, there, the question is, is the level of ACE2 receptors increased in certain types of individuals or individuals with certain characteristics, or do, uh, are the levels generally the same for everyone? Um, they say the number of receptors are genetically predetermined. That's why we're saying that, um, or, or the studies are saying that we cannot really predict until we do genetic uh, epigenetic studies. So when you do epigenetic studies, there are genes that will uh, predispose you to developing more ACE2 receptors than the other individual. But at this point, there's no clinical parameter to to predict who has more ACE2 receptors than the other. Um, if I may add to that, in the recent uh, webinar also of the World Allergy Organization, the WISC uh, conference recently conducted, uh, there have been studies that uh, showed high levels of the ACE2 receptor among asthmatic patients. So they um, they're saying that asthmatics have some sort of protection, but at the same time, uh, when the, when asthmatics get infected with a COVID nineteen virus, their uh, their their course tends to also be very severe. Okay. Uh. So yeah, that's it's interesting because now they're also saying part of your first line of defense would be your eosinophils. Um, so, and we know that eosinophils are one of the main uh, components or main, main, uh, yeah, main components of your allergic diseases. And a lot of asthmatics have the uh, the atopy or the gene for atopy. So, I guess that's the link. Maybe we should now look into the eosinophils in terms of uh, prognosticating patients with COVID. Correct. Uh, That's peculiar. Uh, in my humble experience, for the 17 patients that I've seen, uh, one of my mortalities was an asthmatic patient, mm -hmm. uh, but that was the only case that I had who was asthmatic. The others were elderly, hypertensive, diabetic, and with COPD. And some were already on, on end-stage renal disease. But I've only had one case of asthma we lost that patient because consequently that patient also had multiple infections together with the uh, later stage. Yes. Uh, I also had a patient uh, referred to me two weeks after the development of symptoms. The patient was already intubated. Uh, that's when we gave the full dose of the IVIG. Um, her course was very stormy, but she eventually... Uh, got discharged after two months in the ICU. Mm -hmm. Took that long also. Okay. 
uh, going to going back to the convalescent plasma, the timing. Since convalescent plasma and steroids are best given early in the disease before the onset of the cytokine storm, what criteria do we use to decide whether to give them already or not? So would we recommend giving them routinely uh, to all patients? Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, this question is, again, as I said earlier, best answered by hematologists, but I'll answer in their behalf uh, since we are always communicating here. Uh, they give Here in Cebu, they gave it during the first sign of deterioration with a progression of the inflammatory markers. Usually that's for stage two. Uh, that's why upon admission, if the patient is admitted, automatic part of the workup, blood type. No? And... Uh, background illnesses, and then uh, it's still a gray area because sometimes uh, there are patients who do not follow the course. Now, generally in the first five to seven days, the viremia phase, uh, a lot of I know, close monitoring is done, but the moment the patient shows progressing pneumonia with, an, with elevations in your CRP, ESR, ferritin, most of the IDS colleagues of ours will already recommend giving uh, convalescent plasma, especially if there's already an increasing trend for oxygen support prior to intubation, ideally, because uh, once the patient is intubated, it adds to the poor prognosis. Most of the patients that I've lost are either intubated or already with declining renal function. Yeah, um, that's true. That is a challenge of um, really determining when to give convalescent plasma or for any immunomodulator for that matter, because it's a case-to-case -case thing. So um, in our division of allergy and immunology, we have uh, recommended that at any time that the patient deteriorates, you know, O2 saturation goes down, all these clinical, clinical parameters, which may suggest that the patient is going into early cytokine storm, then we can give the, the convalescent plasma that early. If we understand the mechanism of action of convalescent plasma, it will it will address uh, the virus outside the cell, so they yeah. become neutralizing antibodies. So once the virus is inside the cell, your convalescent plasma will not be effective anymore. And when there's so many viruses already because it has replicated, then it's so difficult to just you know run after each and every virus. So the key is to start early. How do we know that the patient is, is going into early cytokine storm? The recommendation that we suggested, um, I'm sorry, this is, the, this is for the recommendation for convalescent plasma by the hematologists of the Department of Medicine of UPPGH is the same recommendations for IVIG, which is recommended by our section of the UPPGH. So IVIG convalescent plasma, they have similar uh, modes of action. It, they should be given early in the course of the disease because the mechanism is, of action is um, neutralizing the viruses even before they enter the host cell. Uh, let me add to that. I totally agree. No, Here in Cebu, we started giving convalescent plasma the other week. No? We are so grateful for the help given by St. Luke's Medical Center. Many of our colleagues who got morbidly sick and some of our very critical patients really improved after receiving convalescent plasma. In fact, my the referrals for IVIG, I'm speaking in uh, for myself. Have there have been lesser referrals since many of them the course will turn around after receiving convalescent plasma. Yes, I agree. The timing is really very critical. Uh, these immunomodulators, these neutralizing antibodies, should really be given at the onset of. Uh, respiratory deterioration or deterioration of the patient. That's uh, for convalescent plasma uh, before the 14th day of illness. Um, I have another patient. This is a, an elderly male, 79 year old male with all the comorbidities. When his, uh, when his respiratory rate started to increase to the 30s. 
that's when we stepped in and gave the IVIG. He was never mm -hmm. intubated and uh, was discharged um, eventually. Okay. Um, on the topic still of convalescent plasma, after donating, after a, pa uh, uh, after a patient who has recovered from, uh, after donating convalescent plasma, how soon can one donate again? I know this is a question for the hematologists, but would you, <laughs> would you have an idea? Uh, well, I'm not so sure, no, because there have been studies showing that the IgG declines after two to three months, no? So after donating convalescent plasma, I think there needs to, uh, there's a need to recheck the titer and it has to be based on that. If it's much too lower than the cutoff for what is required, maybe that patient cannot donate anymore. Yeah, I think they have their own protocols because anemia would be a contraindication also for donating. I'm, I'm sure for you to get one bag of plasma, you might need to you know, draw 500 ml of uh, blood. So I'm sure the hematologists would have criteria as to when they can uh, get blood again from a previous convalescent plasma donor. Okay. Um, there's a question now on steroids. Uh, there was a mention that steroids are helpful in the early stage of the cytokine storm. So how do we recognize the early stage clinically? I think this is related to the previous question. Yeah. Um... The most effective time actually for steroids to work is if you exactly know when you got infected and you can predict that, oh, in five days you will be symptomatic. But if you're so sure that you got exposed, that would be the golden time of giving your steroids. But for most patients, for most people, you, you walk around, you don't know who has the COVID virus, you don't know when you got infected. So at the, early, at the earliest time that you get probably mild symptoms, then yes, yeah, steroids may work. I don't know if this also has any connection with patients with asthma who are on chronic intranasal or inhalant steroids. Maybe, you know, being on chronic steroids may have protected them from the early phase of the infection of COVID. We don't know because these asthmatics may either be genetically protecting itself from the virus or it's their inhaled steroids that's protecting them for a very, from a more severe disease. Uh, might I add, uh, in my humble experience, no, that's why every time the patient is admitted, we really have to do a very meticulous history to determine the day of illness. Like I said, majority of patients recover, no, they only reach up to stage one, no, the viral phase. However, for those who reach stage two, uh, that's why it's most data gathered shows it's around seventh to the 14th day. And on stage two, there's already beginning difficulty of breathing. If you do a high resolution CT scan of the chest showing beginning infiltrates, and then when you check the markers, they start elevating. Uh, the elevation of the markers, there is still no consensus on the, on the follow, on the, uh, what level we should start. But for me, once <laughs> ferritin is above 1,000, the dimer is above a certain cutoff, LDH is above 400, we already have a, uh, uh, no, we already start considering giving steroids and maybe the immunomodulators. Thank you. Uh, are there any common contraindicated uh, treatment or drugs that should be considered when patients are giving immunomodulators for COVID? I guess that will be on a case-to-case -case basis, diba? What immunomodulator are you talking about? What is the what are the comorbidities of the patient? So it really is a case to case. If they are allergic to a particular component or drug 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 component, then that is a contraindication. But we cannot uh, speak for each and every patient, and we cannot speak for each and every immunomodulator. Thank you, Doctor Aleta. Uh, okay. With yeah. regards to IVIG, you no, know, since it's the it's what some of us are giving here. Uh, the fears. I will echo the fears of some of our colleagues. No, they're afraid because the fear of an anaphylaxis, they're afraid of adverse reactions. Well, if we review the, the available 
data, their adverse reactions are quite are actually very low, and most of them are rate related. That is why I always explain to my other colleagues that when we give IVIG, it must be in a very slow regulated rate, and the patient is monitored. And even with the incidence of anaphylaxis, it's really really very low. In fact, it's considered rare. No, and if the patient does incur an adverse reaction for the IG, IVIG administration, it's not a reason to discontinue. No? Since most of them are rate-related, you can either decrease the rate and go back to the gradual progression until you reach a maximum of 80 cc or 100 cc per hour until you finish the entire drip. So far, most of the patient, all the patients I've given IVIG ha have had no adverse reactions. No? Personally, I don't reach the 100 cc per hour, only up to 80 cc per hour. So, segurista ako. But totally the, the risk for rate-rated reactions will not happen. Okay. <laughs> You're very conservative at 80 cc per hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what are the chances of getting reinfected with COVID-19? Have you had any experience about reinfection? For me, wala. Not yet. Hopefully, well. <laughs> oh, oh. Erta, the reinfection is really based on how will you be exposed again. So yes. if you've been exposed and you've had the, the disease, I'm sure you should you would be more careful in dealing with other people. And hopefully, if, well, if we're going to think as an immunologist and know that, oh, you've, you have antibodies, you're protected. Logically, and for most viruses, you are protected for at least, this is very, very conservative, uh, nine months. Again, we have to think of how the antibodies are formed, how it is replaced in our bodies, if they're not permanent. But again, we have patients who lose their immunity after a year or two, for example, for, for influenza. That's why we have our influenza vaccine every year because it changes or the immunity changes. So to be reinfected, is based on two things, your exposure to the virus, mutations of the virus, and your immune status. Has your immune status improved or worsened? And then those, those are the things that can probably make you more predisposed to another infection. Yes, might I add, part of the discharge instructions for even for patients who have recovered, they should not let down their guard. They will continue wearing masks, hand washing frequently, and social distancing. <laughs> yes. And there's a suggestion here, a comment. Uh, can reinfection be considered by the DOH? Well, maybe the PCP can address this. Uh, because if it's a reinfection, then uh, there'll, be a, there'll be a double entry of cases into the registry. Wow. <laughs> the PCP can, can do something about this. OK. Last question, is COVID-19 less virulent among those who receive vaccines? Uh, for, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of semantics. Eh? What do you mean by virulence? It is, it is annoying. It is, uh, well, it is a characteristic of the virus. Eh? But when you say immunity, it's the characteristic of the host. So I don't think we the host has anything to do with the virulence of the virus. It's it's in it's innate in the virus. So if it has mutated, they say it has mutated. That's why virulent means it can infect more people. So mas modeling mahawa, but it's not as deadly as the initial strain. So they say. But for us to be for us for. Us, well, our immune system can be the same for the whole year, but the virus has changed. And then, so the virulence is a, a virus uh, character. Oh, okay. There's another question here. Can you briefly explain as to how remdesivir can decrease the mortality rate in COVID-19? Well, it's an antiviral and it acts on the virus, I guess. So... Um, personally, I did not really study the mechanism of action of remdesivir. I don't know if Dr. Fruto has. I will refer the question to our IDS colleagues. They are the authority. <laughs> I will defer to the IDS specialist for that. 
how about the combination of dexamethasone and pro procaine? I don't think we use that in our institution, so I cannot comment. We uh, do give dexamethasone, but not with procaine. No? The dose that we use is the one in the study, six milligrams once daily for at least minimum of 10 days. We do give it concurrent with the immunomodulators. What is your thought about giving colchicine as an off-label drug in preventing the cytokine storm since it has an anti-inflammatory effect? If you're willing to give colchicine, I suggest you try the other, um, other immunomodulators that have proven mechanism of action against COVID-19. So you have your steroids, you have your, I'd, I'd still go with hydroxychloroquine though, if you're willing to try colchicine. So, but then I have not come across any study on colchicine being effective, particularly for SARS-CoV-2. There are more questions from Facebook. Uh, more of a comment. Uh, Dr. Nora Otus uh, commented that we do not do epigenetic studies of receptors. Receptors are studied by genotyping of the ACE2 receptors. There are no studies yet showing that ACE receptors are methylated. So after a web the webinar, we will flash a poster of the next webinar. Uh, what steroid do you recommend? Hydrocortisone, methylprednisolone, dexamethasone for stage one to help lessen the progression of the disease. There are, there are our case studies that have been published and it was cited in our PSI review paper that what did seem to work in these case studies uh, was methylprednisolone. Methylprednisolone, oh yes. Yes, uh, uh, yes Puta, go ahead. For me, uh, I've also used methylprednisone, and we only recently started giving dexamethasone. The study done in Italy, wherein they used dexamethasone, the, one of the rationales there was because dexamethasone was re readily available and cheaper. Methylprednisone, I think, is a more potent steroid, but it's more expensive. That's why more patients are given dexa over methylpred. There in Cebu, you use dexamethasone yeah. more... Then for those who are financially constrained already. Uh, but I have given methyl to some of my patients, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's a comment from Dr. Dr. Lorna Abad, a pediatrics, uh, head of pediatrics of the Department of, uh, Department of Pediatrics of PGH. Uh, there's a consultant now who is having her second bout, a re, uh, second bout of COVID-19 symptoms. She's an asthmatic. She was, uh, she, be, she became symptomatic again two days after discharge. So whether it is a reinfection or what, uh, we probably have to find out. Uh, for patients who have recovered from the respiratory symptoms. No, I don't know. I don't want to. Go ahead, ma'am. Sorry, Hello. I couldn't hear you. Are you? Hello? I couldn't hear you, Dr. Aleta. Dr. Pandali. Sir Kaloy. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I was, I think I was cut. Um, yeah, there are some cases that patients seem to have mild infection and then they get discharged and then later on they crash. And this was uh, associated with cytokine storm. So I don't know if the course of this doctor is such na before kala mo mild lang siya and then kaya nga na discharge as biglang magka-crash kasi cytokine storm na pala after that. So we don't know, possibly. Uh, and another possible reason for that, no? When we give uh, immunologic intervention, sometimes they curtail the response, but these things require time. That's why in many of the admitted patients, they reach at least a minimum of 10 days to 20 days. No, Part of the later part is uh, no, monitoring because we do not know yet really the extent, the length of time the disease will really start to wane. 
Okay, thank you. Um, another question is that among for a patient who has recovered from the respiratory symptoms, eventually developing jaundice, should uh, is this an alarming symptom? Oh, well, what is the etiology of jaundice? Hemolytic anemia or hepatorenal syndrome? We don't know. Drug-induced hepatitis? We don't know. Oh, here, do you give colchicine oh, and penicillin to mild and outpatient COVID patients? Melatonin. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I don't know if Fruto has. I haven't. Thank you. Fruto, uh, there's a question about the dose of methylpedicillone. Is it 16 milligrams OD? Fruto, Agansha. What's the dose that you use for metal methylpedicillone? Fruto got cut off. There, Fruto. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the dose that you use for methyl prednisolone? Uh, we did what I did. We did what our colleagues in rheumatology do. No, uh, methyl prednisolone pulse therapy, 500 milligrams to one gram in 250 cc D5 water given for three days. Those for the, for the really bad cases. And then for the step down, we either use Methylpred 16 milligrams or the dexamethasone 6 milligrams. Thank you. Here, do you have any idea on the incidence of COVID among patients with HIV? Uh, that is surprising. No? We had, I think, two cases of HIV patients who had COVID. Uh, it was peculiar because they did not, man since they are considered immunocompromised, but they have a, they had a benign course, they were discharged. They only manifested up to stage one of the influenza-like illness. They never reached the, the stage three hyperinflammatory state. Yeah. I can't explain um, why. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's also similar to, although these were just two cases of uh, Bruton's agama plodinia, two patients had very mild COVID, uh, a very mild COVID course. I personally would think that it's because they had an intact innate immune system. They didn't need your antibodies, which is absent in your agama globulinemia. And for HIV, the, 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 the pathology there is your CD4 count is low. So you really don't need the adaptive immune response for COVID. You need your innate immune response. You need your natural neutralizing antibodies, your anti-glycan antibodies. So if you have that and your body is able to overcome the viral load, then you don't get the severe disease. There's an important, thank you, Dr. Aleta. There's an important question here. Please comment on using hydroxychloroquine as prophylaxis. I think there was a journal that came out on that already. Yeah, my comment, prophylaxis, it can be useless if you have not been exposed to the virus. Definitely the golden question. And just a precaution for patients who will take it in the outpatient setting. The oxidants are going to be helpful, as Dr. Teodorico said, that you know, in that there is a lot of, of the immune system, but not strictly for COVID-19. There's an interesting Great. question here. Can the site can a cytokine storm survivor undergo immune amnesia, wherein the immune system would have to relearn all antigens? It's an interesting question. Okay, when you say amnesia, I assume you mean no antibodies. Yes. No antibodies. But cytokine storm is, you're talking about, you know, cytokines, not really antibodies. So, but uh, it's like you're, it's your, like your AFP. You have your, <laughs> you have your Navy. You have your Coast Guard. You have your Army. You have your Marines. So, um, if you deplete one part of your AFP, you still have other 
uh, fighters there. Thank you. One last question, sorry. Have you encountered a patient with RHD, rheumatic heart disease, who got infected with COVID-19? So what are the risks for that patient, if any? Uh, Personally, I haven't. We've had patients who had uh, heart failure, but not due to RHD, a different etiology. Uh, we lost these patients also. <laughs> these patients were above 65 and also, they also had multiple medications on board and they had a uh, low ejection fraction. So this adds to the morbidity of the patient. Okay, so that sums up all our Q&A. Thank you very much. It was a very fruitful exchange of uh, ideas and experiences. Uh, Can I just share key points before go we go? Go ahead. Uh, uh, much like our other colleagues, I am in favor of the multi-specialty approach to COVID-19 since it has a myriad clinical manifestations and it has multi-organ involvement. So I agree with Dr. Aleta, it should be a blanket referral if the patient is admitted. For outpatients, no. no. And then another key point to raise is the time of referral for IBIG administration with respect to the patient's clinical course of the day of illness. Uh, much of the benefits for my, for my patients who were given IVIG, they were really given early. Now at the first sign of deterioration, they were not intubated yet. There was still no renal function decline. Uh, if you give it much later, like majority of my patients, because some subspecialists, subspecialists think that you have to start with the tocilizumab first, you have to start these medications first before considering, no? But, it has been my experience that I know if you give it rather too late, the cascade is already, I know, way beyond controlling. No, at the height of the storm, we really cannot reverse it anymore. So there's no benefit. And then another problem is the price. No, hopefully I don't know how to offset the problem. Here in Cebu, it's twenty thousand plus at the regular pharmacy, but if you buy it from the supplier, it's fourteen fifteen. So I don't know how we can help our patients with the pricing. And then I agree there is a need for more empirical evidence, ideally from randomized controlled trials. There is one ongoing in China right now because most of our, uh, some of our colleagues are not convinced for us to use it, no? because we only based it on the evidence we got from case series studies from China and theoretical rationale from our expert speakers and from the expert opinion. So I do agree we need to gather more data from uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, just to add, Fruto, Dr. Michael Akawili uh, is uh, spearheading a trial on IVIG at the UPPG. Oh. It has already been approved by the Ethics Board and it's currently with the PCHRD. Uh, we're applying okay. funding. So we will have local studies on that. Um, one pahabol question. Please comment <laughs> on a patient having negative IgM and IgG, I'm uh, sorry, positive antibodies, positive IgG and IgM, but the uh, SARS-CoV-2 PCR is negative. Patient is symptomatic with mild dyspnea. So how is this possible? Uh, okay, that's a very common scenario here, no? Uh, in our hospital setting, there are two swab test, now, the one by DOH and the one by our own hospital, which is not DOH accredited, we call it the BioFire PCR test. Uh -oh. If the patient fits the clinical profile of a COVID patient, even if the serologic markers are positive and the PCR is negative, we will treat them as a COVID case. We've had several cases wherein the first PCR was negative, but with a repeat PCR second and third, they turn out positive. So there's still a proportion of a false negative result for the PCR. That's why if, if the patient manifests with a clinical COVID-19 profile and the labs do not jive, do not be so ready to dismiss this as a non-COVID patient. I agree, agree. We, we, I also see that in private practice. Uh, patient really looks like he, he or she is in cytokine storm, but RT-PCR is negative. So we treat, as, uh, treat a cytokine storm. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's it. 
thank you again. It was really a very enriching discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lara Teresa Alentahan Aleta, uh, Dr. Ian Fruto Teodorico, and Dr. Maria Socorro Agawili de Jesus, who's working in the background, who's been working with us in the background. Thank you. And the Philippine College of Physicians will have another webinar, PPR in the time of pandemic. Uh, this will be on Monday, same time, 10 o'clock, with Dr. Francis Lavapai Lava Lava of the Philippine Heart Association. Okay, so with that, we'd like to thank all of you for attending. We hope that uh, we have helped you gain more knowledge in managing our fellow Filipinos during this time of pandemic. Thank you very much, everyone.